Good morning everybody on this rather crisp Tuesday morning. I believe there is snow on the mountain, or well, snow in Cirrus, and uh, many other tops of the mountains, so hence the chill in the air this morning. I pray that you've all had a good night's rest, and that um, last night when I was ministering, thank you Jackie, been ministering on the call of God on your life, the 25th of May 2020. I really pray that the call that you received and responded to last night is burning inside of you, the call of God that causes us to rise up and to enter into the labors that he has already prepared for us even before the foundation of the earth, that you were created for his good pleasure and that he could have done this without us, but he chose to do it with us. How beautiful is that? That is so amazing, so amazing. So if you didn't manage to get on at 7 p.m. last night on the live, it is still up on my Facebook page and you are so very welcome to go and listen to that message. Um, I really know it was the Holy Spirit that uh, really stirred up that we move in the gifts and calling of God and we live our most um, powerful life because of the authority that we have in Him and the privilege that we have to manifest His kingdom wherever we go. It's not a works program. It is a lifestyle that we give him our full heart and our whole life for his glory and the glory of the Father. Father, we just thank you this morning that as we gather, even in quite a chilly Cape Town, <laughs> that those that are watching from near and far this morning will receive a revelation of who you are, even in a deeper measure. Holy Spirit, thank you for the work that you are doing on in us at this time. And as you are hovering over the face of the earth, keep impacting nations to the glory of the Father. Thank you that you are the one that was promised when Jesus ascended well jesus said he must decrease john said he must de decrease so jesus will increase and when jesus left the earth he said one exactly like me my exact representation will come wait in the upper room for the holy spirit so we thank you holy spirit for the work that you are doing that you lead us into all truth in jesus name Amen. So the Holy Spirit is, no, is not magic. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he was sent to the earth uh, by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Decided long ago before the foundation of the earth. That after the eternal covenant of the blood of Jesus. That Jesus would return to his Father. And that they would send the blessed Holy Spirit to do the work in us because he has no limits of time or space and his full job is to reveal the work of Jesus in us because it's already there when you come unto salvation that you already received his fullness. And then when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was an activation of the manifestation of the attributes of the supernatural nature of Jesus. The gift truly are the fivefold ministry. And then signs, wonders, tongues, interpretation of tongues, 
healings, supernatural working miracles, those are the manifestations of the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in us that reveals the kingdom. Because their question was, how will we know? How will we know that it's you? And Jesus actually said, they may, may not be convinced by your signs and wonders. <laughs> and so he encouraged his disciples, don't get all excited that you can cast out demons. Get excited that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This morning I was sitting with my two, two of my five granddaughters, the two that uh, are in the home that I live in, and, um, and, and expounding to them the power of the blood and that how people over the ages have told children, if you're naughty, Jesus won't love you. And made it all about good behavior. And I was telling them about the forgiveness of sins and the blood of Jesus. And explained to them what a covenant was. How they would sh shed blood and make covenant. Your family line and my family line are in a covenant. And they were like, oh, because of the blood, you know. And so I'm, tr I'm busy revealing for them the mystery that is no longer a mystery because Jesus was the mystery hidden and now he is revealed. Now he is revealed. And I believe that the work of the Holy Spirit is moving from a place of mystery to a place of manifestation in the fact that we will live in the Spirit and not by according to this flesh. When we live in the Spirit, Splits and schisms and factions move out of the way because it's called the spirit and truth. And the word of God says, see that there be no wicked way in me. He who can come into the hill of the Lord, to the mountain of our God. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And a pure heart is a heart that has been totally impacted by the work of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, and peace. We only have fightings amongst ourselves because we compare ourselves amongst ourselves. And we want to be the best of, of the pile. Nobody's very keen to take the runt of the litter of puppies. <laughs> and so we start to measure ourselves against earthly measurements, whether it's on membership, whether it's on how many fell down, whether it's on how many you baptize, that measurement will be dependent on the primary gifting that is on your life. If you're evangelist, you will measure everybody in the body of Christ to how many people they brought unto salvation. If you are a teacher, you will measure it by, oh, you know, it's not just uh, making converts, you have to disciple them and teach them. And yet the word says that when the Holy Spirit comes, you won't even have need of another teacher, for he will teach you and lead you into all truth. So we really need to uh, embrace the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's quite scary that there are large sections of the Church of Jesus Christ that do not acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit. They believe that he came to bring gifts to the earth and the establishment of the church, but that um, signs and wonders and miracles don't happen uh, any longer. And that all of it will come into pass when we go to heaven. So it doesn't matter to those that believe that way. It doesn't matter if you uh, your body is broken because um, and you're not getting healed, because when you get to Jesus, you'll be whole. And yes, there is a truth in it, but it's not the full truth. And Father has uh, sent Jesus so that we can walk in divine health. And so we can speak to our bodies. We can speak to the atmosphere. This morning I woke up with such joy, such joy. And what does joy cause one to do? It causes me to have hope for the future it causes me to be able to dream beyond what i can measure it causes me to burst out of my bed pick up my puppy 
and go upstairs and start to enthuse over the rest of the family about how wonderful God is. I've never seen a joyful person uh, preach or teach something negative. If you are filled with hope and expectation of the call that is upon your life, knowing that nothing can, can hinder what God has decreed over you, it gives you not only a buoyancy, uh, but it, it causes the enemy to be scattered because joy is not part of who he is. And so there are some things that will only come down in your life when you come in an opposite spirit. Depression will flee at the anointing and presence of joy. Joy is a person. Jesus is joy. Jesus is wisdom. Jesus is knowledge. Jesus is understanding. Jesus is wonder. Wonderful. Wonderful. Jesus is awe and wonder. Jesus is Prince of Peace. Love, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. The more not the more you have of him because you have the fullness of the Godhead when you became born again. It's to the degree that you allow him. It's to the degree that you open the doors and throw away the locks, not to some cruel person that is going to talk you down, but to the Lord himself. He Jesus is a wise counselor. If you lack wisdom about how to go forward now, you need to creep inside of him who is wisdom so that you feel like you have dressed yourself with him and you are walking forward into wisdom. There may be many of you that are thinking about where you're going to live in the future and what you're going to, how you're going to earn in the future. I want to start to excite you about the fact that when God comes to bring the new, he always totally removes the old. He says the old must go before the new can come. And so do not be perplexed about that that is falling away. That is the purpose of shaking. Shaking has a purpose and it's to shake out lethargy, apathy, same old, same old. We are meant to be going from one degree of glory to another. And when the Father sees your open heart for you to be promoted and go and come into a greater level of glory. He is excited to, to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to release you into greater realms of glory. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not that measurable now that we are not in a building. The measurement was never for God. The measurement has always been for man that we feel accomplished when we can measure it. How do I know? Because I remember even saying, Saying to my husband Lionel, I would say to him, why don't we just go into Africa and start a Christian school and like a mission station? I said, at least that is measurable. I said, I feel like we are plowing and plowing and plowing, but there's nothing to measure. And because um, our heart of hearts, we want to be able to touch and feel and weigh up what we have been doing. But does the word not clearly say that our reward is not in this life? It's in the life that is yet to come. And so uh, even though we can't measure, God is measuring. And he is measuring us to increase, not to decrease. So that doesn't mean that he is... Um, when I say to increase and not to decrease, that doesn't mean that I am saying that he wants huge churches. When I say to increase, more love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. So he's measuring out measurements of grace, measurements of glory, measurements of anointing. And he's pouring it out 
on the earth and on his children so that the kingdoms of this world become strangely dim. And there are so many programs of people taking the seven mountains. Excuse me, I don't mean to be critical. I'm using this to explain to you that we are not taking physical kingdoms. And so there's so much teaching about that we have to infiltrate all these kingdoms. When Jesus came, he did not agree with the political leaders. He did not try and make everybody little Christs. He came with a message of redemption and salvation that saves us from this system and from this world. And so that we are no longer citizens of this, but we are citizens of heaven that's why the word of god says we are no we are now seated with him in heavenly places because we are subject to the head and jesus is the head of the church and so maybe you're concerned about what's going to happen some are excited to know that eventually the church doors will open because they can't wait to go back to their church buildings. Some are in fear and trepidation and not, not fear as in afraid. They are in fear of the Lord, holiness unto God, that they do not want the church to open and less it is God's way and God's time. For we no longer are part of a church that is built with hands. The Lord's injunction to us, will you not prepare a place for me? This is the place that we have prepared for him. He no longer dwells in buildings made by hand. He dwells within us. And we know each other by the spirits by the spirit that does not necessarily mean that we will all be in our little glass boxes only seeing each other in cyberspace it doesn't mean that but maybe the shape i say maybe for your for your benefits because i know like i know but maybe the shape of church is changing Maybe we are going to see churches on every street as we meet in our neighbors' homes. Maybe God is raising up firehouses, and not with the fire department, firehouses where people know they can go to get healing, to get outpouring of God's Spirit, to have somebody lay hands on them to worship together, to eat a Shabbat meal on a Friday night. You see, we only hold on to what we know because we don't know what the unknown is. But once we are in the unknown and it becomes our reality, we will look back to from the shape that we've changed from and the place that we've come to with great joy and the yoke of slavery will become less and less and less. And I think that we will meet in big buildings for celebrations. For Jesus went both to the temple and he went house to house. He didn't curse the temple. He didn't say, because you go in robes and smells and bells to a temple, I don't know you. He still went to the temple and he opened the scroll in Isaiah and he read at the temple. He didn't condemn it, but he said, let's go. I'm coming to your house for tea. So we see there are different formations of what the church can look like, but it's going to be the church on the move. It's going to be the church in locality. It's going to be the church on Fifth Street. It's going to be the church on the street called straight. It's going to be about doing life together. You're all extremely quiet on this live this morning as your thoughts are being stretched and you're going, really? Church in the supermarket, church on the beach. <laughs> you are so right. I can't see who that person was. Michelle Marquis, I agree with you. We can no longer go back to church on a Sunday, as in church on Sunday only, she says. I agree, we are living stones. 
We are a living body. We are the children of the Most High God. We are a people that have been fashioned for His glory. In a so true, Azusa Street was the ugliest building in the earth. People were offended by what it looked like. So much so that even though the greatest part of Azusa Street was uh, of Azusa Street was the fact that the Holy Spirit had come in such thick measure that the children even played hide and seek in the cloud of his glory. It was so thick, but because of the head of man and the reasoning of man, they had to eventually build a wall around it because the building was the tin shanty. You see, God is not looking for stained glass windows. He is not looking for that of the best technology. He is looking for hearts that have been surrendered to him. We are having a deeper fellowship this way. In the last um, 50 days, no, no, I'm wrong. It's even more than that. In the last 10 weeks, in the last 10 weeks of lockdown, yeah, it's just 50 odd days, um, if I'm right, 10, 7, no, 70 days. So it's, we're having greater fellowship with one another. We dream about each other. We think about each other. We send messages to encourage each other. Whereas when we go to the building at the end of the meeting, we hug each other and we feel and it's not a conscious thing, but we feel that our responsibility to one another is finished now. I will see you next Sunday. <laughs> and so God is causing us to be the living church. The living church. Is it scary? For me it is. Why is it scary for me? Because it's easier to work with that that you can measure. But I'm beginning to realize that all that God did in Lionel and I and the people that he has given us, you know, that um, those that he gives you, you're responsible for their spiritual well-being, to keep directing them to Christ. And you can measure it. But there also became a, um, there also becomes an ownership on leaders to own people. And I believe that Jesus is taking his church back. Wonderful to see Pastor Errol Wesson and his wife Claudia's name just came up. And I want to say to you, to, to you Pastor Wesson, uh, you have always been one that has been acknowledged in the kingdom of God, you and your wife. For long, long ago, you had already burst out of the walls of the organized church. And you were wor working with those in the highways, the byways, those that were marginalized. Missions became your greater thrust. And you were already breaking the mold. And Father says that you are a father to the fatherless and you will even in this these days you and your wife claudia will be a mother and father to many that you have learned to see the treasure in people the treasure over cities and nations and being dreamers you've been showing the people how to dream and bring them to not just jesus on a shelf but Jesus in everyday life and father says well done my good and faithful servant and he says many 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 men and women of God will come to you in this time be drawn to you for restoration for they have been burnt in the fields of God and they are looking for moms and dads that are walking in authentic end time anointing and God will use the two of you mightily in this time. God bless you. 
And Father says as well that this anointing is not only on you and Claudia, but on your children and on your children's children. Father says you are a, many generations in your family that have the, the thumbprint of God on your lives. God bless you. Yes, Robert McManus, I agree with you. The day of normal church is over. So I remember many years already. Excuse me, as I just get a, my coffee. Many years already, God instructed myself and Lionel to deregulate Word of Life. And so we started to uh, deregulate a few things. One of them was membership. And the Lord said that we are a body and a family and a kingdom. And he said, if they come, they are part of your family. And the um, qualifying factor is that they are of the family of God. And if they wanted to join anything, they could join the gym and get their free coffee after so many stamps. But if they came to the ministry that we were running uh, as Word of Life, they were they were qualified because they were the children of God and the, they were those that were coming into the family. And so we were no longer uh, enlisted by membership. We were, in, we were pushed together as the family of God with one message, one loaf. And we also felt that God said, the Lord said, do not run the church by programs, run the church by who I am. And who that I say I am, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so we started fellowshipping around his presence. And by fellowshipping around his presence, we've had amazing, we had amazing encounters with God and with the Holy Spirit. And he started to um, encourage us about this concept that there will be lights, fire lights, in each and everybody's home and then he would come and just blow upon those living flames and that is how uh, revival would come so now as the church is in lockdown the lord is encouraging us to let our fire burn to fill ourselves let him fill us with oil that we are busy trimming the wick that we are a bride that's getting ready but for before the wedding feast of the lamb we are bringing the lost and we are bringing the broken and we are not pres prescriptive about how they should dress to come to our building or oh, not that that is an issue, but it's terrible when it becomes an issue. But now we are saying Jesus loved you just the way he found you. And it's by his blood. It's not about a building. It's the blood of Jesus that has set you free. It's the blood of Jesus that gives you divine health. It's the blood, those 39 stripes. It's in the power of the shed blood. It's in the power of the cross. It's not not even about eloquent preaching anymore it's not even about what color you wear pastors have even gone through and public speakers have even gone through what is the most appropriate color that will attract people's attention and there's this teaching that you have so many minutes or seconds to create uh, to create a an impression <laughs> one of the most the most uh, uh the most constant thing i would moan at my husband about is you take too long you take too long darling people will not sit more than 40 minutes and yet i find that the people like smith wigglesworth and these mighty revivalists they they um uh, prayed and read the word 
even when people came to consult Smith Wigglesworth, he would say, welcome, let's read the word together. And they would read the word. And then he'd say, and let us pray. And when he finished praying, he said, let us read some more. And they fellowshiped around the word. There was no instant and um, instant uh, gratification. There was a laboring in the place of the spirit. And so our homes right now in lockdown, we find ourselves dipping in again and again into the word. And our, and our worship is beginning to come from the heart place and not the three songs that we sing over and over again. That Father is raising us up to release a sound, a sound. Hannah um, was accused of being drunk for they could not even understand the words for there were no words she has seeking the father in groans and utterings they thought he was drunk when Peter burst out of the upper room they said what have they been drinking how can they be drunk at 10 o'clock in the in the morning and the good news will be what what you used to be careful about how you said it will now suddenly begin to come out of your mouth because you have been filled up and the people around you will get the overflow the anointing that is accumulating on the children of God we're going to live out of our intimate history and our intimate relationship with him and will release it will release such a deluge of the love of God that they will come unto salvation because they are drawn, 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 drawn to the one that is stronger. In, when we are weak, his strength rises, strength will rise as a weight upon the Lord. It's the Lord's strength that will take us in this worldly system to have uh, power and, uh, and anointing. Without the anointing, we only have theory. And God wants us to be a living epistle. He wants us to be demonstrators of his divine nature. There will be signs and wonders following the preaching of the word. The preaching of the word. Uh, it's a little sad that the word has become thin and people say, don't quote the Bible, you'll put them off. But you know that the word has become flesh and dwells amongst us. Just tell them your lifestyle. Tell them what Jesus has done. Tell them. I pray that you are encouraged to find that good report of what he is, has done, of what he is doing, of what he's already completed, that we are entering into from glory to glory to glory, an ever increasing glory, not a fading glory, an ever increasing glory that we are demonstrating. That's right, uh, Nalita, that we are demonstrators of his divine natures, nature, and that nature is a God kind. That they will come to your fire house, your house, and say, we need you to pray with us. Because we can see that you have a relationship with the living God. And they will be drawn to Jesus Christ in you. In you. That is what qualifies you. The love of Jesus that lives inside of you. Are you ready? Are you ready? You see, I agree now. One of my friends, uh, Julie, says, I feel I can breathe again. I agree. Because we have made measurements for people to qualify 
for the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God is summed up, love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost, and where you go, the kingdom goes with you. We have qualified people by conferences, um, uh, things that they have to attend when they already are the temple of the living God. They're walking in the temple. Are you ready? Are you ready to invite people in to have a meal with you? Are you ready in that meal to demonstrate the love of Jesus? Are you ready to be his firehouse where the anointing of God is evident? Are you ready to share your life with your neighbor? Are you ready to share your goods with the neighbors? Are you ready? I'm ready. And I'm glad that you are ready. Because Jesus lives in you and Jesus lives at your address. You know, when my wonderful husband, Lionel, and I got filled with the Holy Spirit, the church that we were training with to be pastors, uh, very, very kindly but very politely let us go. <laughs> hmm. In that time, because you're coming out of something you know and now you've been thrown into, you think into nothing. And in that time, a family picked us up. And we would go to them virtually every evening. They would phone and say, have you made any plans for food or for supper? We go, no. They say, come to us. And we would pick up our little children and go and eat peanut butter sandwiches and coffee with them. It wasn't about roast lamb and four courses, it was about fellowship. There were some days that she didn't have uh, a meal, but she would throw together flour, eggs, and uh, sometimes not even eggs, throw together stuff in great vegetables like carrots and put it in the oven and out would come sometimes a sweet cake and sometimes a savory cake, and that's what we would have for supper. When we were first in ministry and there wasn't a lot of provision, that family said, once a week, we will deliver to your door a box of fruit and veg. And they did that for over a year, that that was the provision that they could bring. So when I say we're moving from this out of that system into something that we're still trying to get a handle on. Thank you, Karen. Yes, growing under your leadership and ministry with no membership and programs. We, for the first time, understood freedom. Let me just see what else it says here. Yeah? In the presence of God but more than ever felt part of the body. And as our spiritual leaders, you encourage us to go, go and be the light and the life and firehouse, firehouses. So true, Karen, so true. And, and so it wasn't difficult for us to trust by faith in those days. We just knew God will do it. But first, he had to deal with my pride. <laughs> we know what you are talking about, Nalita and I, and I have been invited to leave. <laughs> oh, my word. And so, um, and just get my bearings here. Um, yeah, it, it, it was just um, trusting God in the early times of our ministry was a part of the course. 
we were not measuring each other about how many fancy things we had. I did have some of them, but oh yes. But first, God had to remove my pride. Because I grew up in a home with very little, but you didn't have debt. And there was always food on the table. There was never luxuries, but there was always food on the table. And we were taught to be self-sufficient. One day, in the early days of ministry, I had very little in the fridge. I had a little tin of jam and maybe some bread rolls, but nothing much else. When you, even your, your basics are depleted. And a lady stopped, her and her husband, stopped in, outside our home, our little townhouse, and knocked on our door and said, the Lord showed us that you have a need. I said, no, we're fine. So lovely to see you. We're fine. They went and they sat in their car and they were so perplexed. They came to the door again. He said, I know you have a need. And eventually, the, the third time he knocked on the door, he said, whether you have a need or not in your eyes, God has alerted us that you have a need. And they op opened the boot and they started bringing those packets of food in. And I wasn't sure. I was embarrassed. And the tears started to run down my face and I said, I am so sorry. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord. God sees to your every need and not only your physical need. He sees to your emotional need. The other day the dogs went crazy and the dogs were barking and I was on my bed and I didn't get up. My door was closed and I was just um, enjoying a break, a rest time between 10 o'clock and 7 o'clock live. I was just, and then Leon came to my bedroom door. He said, you have a delivery. I said, what do you mean? I heard the dogs barking. And I said, it must be, and I won't say who the couple is. I said, it must be from so-and-so. He said, no, it's not. And he came in. I'm going to try and show it to you. He came in with this beautiful branch of greenery with these amazing conkers. All of those conkers, what, I think it's a eucalyptus tree. Correct me if you know. Look how beautiful they are. Every one of them with their red color on the inside and it was wrapped in white paper with string or twine and with it was a brown packet and in the brown packet was a loaf of sourdough bread and a packet of chuckles from Woolworths. And I looked on my phone, this person had tried to phone, they needed my address, and I decided just to leave my phone and not, and just to rest. And they eventually got hold of Jess and said, we're not coming in, obviously, we just want to drop something at the gate. They live in a town or observatory. They took a drive and they delivered it to the gate. And it was a love letter, that to me was a love letter from the Father as he said, I want you to just bless Rose that she knows that I know about her. Isn't that precious? When the simple things begin to minister to us, and we can share with one another. So I know that there are many looking to us as leaders now about what we're going to do. 
even when the government says we can meet. I do not have a three point, a five point, a 10 point, a 12 point plan. I just know that will never be the same again. It will be better. It will be each one being used of God. Why do leaders not want to let it go? Because they are afraid that they won't be able to pay their bills. But God has not called us to be hirelings. Oh, I just feel God's anointing in an amazing way. He's not called us to be hirelings. He's called us to demonstrate his love one to another. There have been days that I've said to the Lord, Father, I'll be 65 this year. Are we going to continue to go up those stairs every week? What is the future of the church? Christ in us. Christ surrounds us. Christ goes before us. There's such a fight going on. Why are the churches not open? Why are they preventing us preaching the gospel? Rubbish. That is not true. We are his living epistle. Not buildings made by hands. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. I've said this so many times, and I'm being very vulnerable today, so many times to the, my, the people that gather in our ministry. You are not our pay packets. That the real field is out in the highways and the byways. that we want each of you to be preachers of the gospel, to walk in your call and your anointing. And when we assemble ourselves together, it will be to encourage one another, to build each other up, to be seated in the corporate anointing. Already there is a judgment from man to say there are many churches that will collapse and not reopen. It's not to collapse. It's to scatter the, the word of God abroad. It's to, to cause the body to become a living, moving body. Not of a temple made by hands. But a body that will live by the Spirit. And from the Spirit. It's going to be so exciting. 
It's going to be so exciting. The church is going to grow without measure. People will be saved. The harvest is coming and is already begun and the end result will be revival. Do not stop up your ears to the doom and gloom people and rejoice for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No longer will you be a hiding and measured by your doctrine. You'll be measured by the love of Jesus and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, you won't be measured by that. You'll be measured about what Jesus has already done. We are living in the most exciting days on the face of the earth. Where it's not by might nor by power, but by our God. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the message of salvation. I thank you for the power of the blood. I thank you for the church of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, a people that are fire lighters, a people that are fire carriers, a people that are making themselves ready, set apart to the glory of their father. I thank you that you're going to blow on us. We're not going to pump ourselves up. You're going to blow on us. And the fire of revival will be seen on the face of the earth. All the accolades will move out of the way. And the power of the cross will bring us into great glory, demonstrations of signs and wonders that will unveil Jesus Christ amongst us. Thank you for the harvest that is being loosened. And in a vision, I see the angels loosening, loosening in the fields, people that are planted in religion and half truth, and they just loosening the harvest. And then the sweeping of his spirit brings the harvest in. I thank you for revival. I thank you for the kisses of heaven. I thank you for grace. I thank you for mercy. I pray that you will bless us today with your, with your um, presence. That will be, your presence will be thick on us, in us, around us, in our homes. That we surrender everything to you. That our lamps are filled with your oil and your presence. What joy. Amen. What joy. What joy. That we're not trying to qualify ourselves. That he has qualified us. And the fullness of his presence overflows to those around us. Have a wonderful day. You are so loved. You are accepted in the beloved. His joy completes you. His love surrounds you. Don't fear the future. Don't even fear your provision. God will make a way where there seems to be no way.
He makes all things beautiful in his time. Thank you for that beautiful word, Kada. Thank you. I will see you this evening at seven o'clock. God bless you.